I'd like to, to start by thanking this hotel for allowing us to have our dinner here. And uh, some, of <laughs> some of you will know uh, of the problems we had uh, with uh, two other hotels in town. Um, and uh, the first one was one which uh, has been used by the, uh, the archdiocese before, uh, but they simply declined. You could name them. Well, I could, couldn't I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they took the view, the, uh, the manager took the view that, um, I'm sorry to tell you this actually, Professor Plymouth, took the view that Professor Plymouth wasn't actually a climate scientist. And then as I, as I talked to the man, I realized that, uh, to the man, I realized that his definition of a climate scientist was a scientist who believes as he does. <laughs> so it's, it's, a very easy, it's a very easy position to take. You simply say, uh, you know, uh, these are climate scientists. If he doesn't believe that, then he's not a climate scientist. End of story. The fact that he's a prof uh, emeritus professor at Melbourne and a professor of mining at the University of Adelaide carries no weight. You know, if you're not, um, if you're not of that view, then you're on the outside. I had some criticism for uh, inviting him, I have to say, from uh, some within our own community. Uh, who thought that it was not the business of the Dawson Centre to be involved in th issues of this sort. And I thought it was very much the, that I still maintain and will go to my grave maintaining, that it's very much our business when there are issues of, of uh, uh, free, freedom of speech. And uh, uh, you have only to look at the news on any of the main uh, media uh, sources to understand that people who hold conservative views, by which I don't mean right wing or left wing for that matter, people who hold conservative views are not getting a fair hearing and will be written off as uh, liars and cheats as soon as look at you if, it, uh, if, if they don't uh, toe the official line or accept the official narrative. So anyway, I've said enough. You haven't come to hear me, you've come to hear Professor Plymer, Ian Plymer, and I have the greatest pleasure in, in uh, introducing him, all, all the more so uh, because it's been so hard getting him to this place. Professor <laughs> 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 Thank you. Well, Your Grace, ladies and gentlemen, and the hotel, uh, thank you for having me and thank you for coming out tonight. We here that carbon dioxide is a pollutant. Well, I'm breathing in 0.04% carbon dioxide and I'm breathing out over 4%. It is the food of life. It is plant food. It is not a pollutant, but it is invisible. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. And like so many things, such as radiation and viruses, you can easily be frightened of something you can't see. And we humans are biologically hardwired to be frightened. That's a survival technique. And this is being exploited. Now tonight, I don't give opinions. I give facts. The first fact is we have one molecule of carbon dioxide per 85,000 molecules in the atmosphere. One in 85,000. And if you look at the carbon dioxide that Australia releases, it's one molecule in six and a half million molecules in the atmosphere. So we are dealing with traces of a trace gas. So why is carbon dioxide, that poor, innocent, invisible molecule, why is it being attacked? Well, it is a symbol of industry. Any heavy industry produces carbon dioxide. And therefore, this is a mechanism of attacking industry. And this attack on industry is easy. Because for 40 years, we have had a dumbing down of our education system. I have had at university students coming into first year 
who cannot write. They can print, but cursive writing is beyond them. They do not know simple things. They cannot commit to memory a large body of information. These people have very strong opinions, but nothing to back it up with. And we have had this attack on our education system for decades, and this is destroying the ability of young people to critically and analytically think. It is destroying the ability of young people to engage in polite argument. That now no longer exists, thanks to the demonic social media. I mean, just don't get on social media. It's pornography. Keep away from it. But we have had a massive attack on our education system, concurrent with a massive attack on many of the aspects of Western civilization that we hold dear. We've had the history wars, the culture wars. There's an attack on Christianity. It's endless. And we are having our society deconstructed, but it's not being replaced by something better. And so the whole move with human-induced global warming has got nothing to do with the environment. It's got everything to do with deconstruction of the way we think and our society as a mechanism of unelected people gaining power. And I'm sick of it. And that's why I wrote this book, Green Murder. It's a full frontal attack on those who are leading the charge. We had in Senate estimates Last year, Malcolm Roberts asked the CSIRO, can you please give me a few scientific papers that prove human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global warming? Now, I know Malcolm well, and he, he uses some of my questions that I feed him. And the CSIRO presented him with one scientific paper, and then it wasn't on the subject. So he asked them again, can you please show me that human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global warming? Now, that's a trick question, we'll come to that. They couldn't. This is a question that I've been asking scientists around the world for 25 years. I've asked journalists this question. I've asked politicians this question. It's no wonder I get cancelled because no one can show from the scientific literature that human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global warming. Now, let's, let's imagine that I'm wrong. And once I was wrong, but I was mistaken. But let's imagine I was wrong. And we say, OK, <coughs> human emissions do drive global warming. Well, the total human emissions are 3% of the total emissions that we get on planet Earth. So if you can show that 3% of emissions drive global warming, you have to show that the 97% of natural emissions, which come from ocean degassing, don't drive global warming. That's never been shown. So we have built this whole empire based on something that cannot be shown. And in fact, you can show the opposite. We know from chemistry about carbon dioxide dissolving in water. The only reason I ordered this is not because I love it, um, but I want you to watch that tonight. And as it warms up, and I don't mind drinking warm beer, um, as it warms up, it is continuing to give off carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has an inverse solubility. So if you make a cup of tea and stir one, one teaspoon of sugar, it'll dissolve. Put in two if you want to poison yourself, or three or four or five, you can dissolve it. But with carbon dioxide, the exact opposite. You can dissolve more carbon dioxide in cold water than it can in warm water. So as that warms up, it's still giving off bubbles. Now we know that from chemistry. We also know it from drill cores in ice. And the drill cores we have in Antarctic and Arctic ice have chemical fingerprints. And we can work out 
when the planet started to warm, or when the poles started to warm up, and we can actually measure little bits of trapped air in that ice and measure the carbon dioxide content of it. And we find that as the planet starts to warm, and we've only seen this every 100,000 years, for going back 34,000 years, 34 million years, should I say, every time the planet warms up, about 650 to 1,600 years later, the carbon dioxide content increases. So in Monday's Mercury, there was a, a letter and a statement claiming that the composition of the atmosphere controls the temperature of the planet. It's the exact opposite. It's the temperature of the atmosphere that controls the amount of carbon dioxide. And <clears throat> the temperature of the atmosphere does not drive climate. It is the temperature of the oceans. That's where the surface heat is held. So if we go back in time, and that's my business, the past is the key to the present. If we go back in time, we can see climate change. I was at Akarula over last weekend with a group of 40 school children. And you can put your finger right on the spot where on a Thursday, 650 million years ago, <laughs> we had the area covered by ice. And I got these kids to work out that at that spot, we had 20 kilometres of ice at the equator at sea level. Now that's climate change. And on top of that was a limestone where we suddenly went from a massive event of cooling into warm conditions when there was a lot of carbon dioxide around. And just after that, we had the Arcarula Reef form. And that is where we get the first complex life on Earth. And that reef was recently discovered. After that is another period where there's an ice age. On top of that is a, is a limey rock. And then there's a, another collection of life that formed, and that's called the Ediacaran fauna. Now, we all know, or should know, that the Ediacaran fauna is the oldest complex life on Earth. No. New science has shown that it's not. And science is not settled. Science is never settled. Now, you all know, I mean, it's, it's written in stone that that dirty big asteroid Written on it, it says dead dinosaur, and that's <laughs> heading for Texas. It misses and it hits Mexico. And it vaporises bits of Mexico 65 million years ago. And that vapour is very sulphur rich. The acids kill vegetation. The dinosaurs have got nothing to eat and they die. What a wonderful, evocative story. It's fabulous. It may not be true. Because we find that just a little bit after that, we have these massive volcanic eruptions, the Deccan traps, uh, with the same basalts that we see all over the world. And these leaked out sulphur gases, which then poisoned vegetation, and the dinosaurs had nothing to eat. So the consensus is that an asteroid hit Mexico and resulted in the killing of the dinosaurs. But there was another view around that is volcanoes in India. Science is never settled. And once science is settled, it's not science, it's political. So let's go back in time a little bit and look at a few big events. We have had three atmospheres on planet Earth. Our first atmosphere had ammonia, methane, a lot of um, carbon dioxide, but it was an ammonia-rich atmosphere. And we enjoyed that for about 2,000 million years. And the atmosphere evolved into a second atmosphere, which was carbon dioxide-rich. And it was much richer than today's atmosphere in carbon dioxide. Today we have 0.04%. In those times, it may well have been up to 20%, but it was certainly 10%. And we know that from the mineral dolomite, which some of you might put onto your gardens. Dolomite is a calcium magnesium carbonate. 48% of the weight of dolomite is the gas, carbon dioxide. Now you can make dolomite in the laboratory. 
The only way you can make it is to have <clears throat> warmish water and an enormous amount of carbon dioxide dissolved in that water and in the air above it. So as soon as you see dolomite in nature, you say, ha, huh, we must have had a very, very carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. And we can work out what it was. Where I was over the weekend, the Flinders Ranges, you can see the dolomites. They go for miles, a buff coloured rock. You can measure the thickness of them, how far they go, measure the volume. And the 48% carbon dioxide came from the atmosphere. You put it back into the atmosphere and you say, oh, our atmosphere must have been at least 100 times richer in carbon dioxide then than it is now. So the world's second atmosphere was carbon dioxide rich. And we're enjoying the third atmosphere, which is oxygen rich. So you cannot argue that carbon dioxide is a pollutant. It is just not possible to do it. Every limestone has 44% carbon dioxide in it. That is carbon dioxide that has been sequestered from the atmosphere into rocks. And in our current times of an oxygen rich atmosphere, the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere has been decreasing. It's decreased enormously. Over the history of time, we have had six great ice ages. Six out of these six ice ages started when there was more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than now. Now, wait a minute, isn't the popular mantra that when you increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you get warming, and if you increase it a bit too much, you get runaway warming. Well, last weekend, I saw two of these, sorry, three, four of these uh, ice ages preserved and written in stone. And these were times when we had much higher carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than now. Yet we didn't have runaway global warming. We had debris left behind by retreating ice. We had evidence that ice was moving and scratching rocks. We had evidence of sea ice. So the mantra is wrong. We hear that we are going to have runaway global warming. Well, we come to that a little bit later. The current ice age we have been in for 34 million years. This was when South America pulled away from Antarctica and we had circumpolar currents around Antarctica. And those circumpolar currents stopped warm water coming to Antarctica. We got Antarctic ice 34 million years ago. And that is driven by a process of pulling apart continents. And so we can look at cycles of climate and we have cycles every 400 million years when we pull apart and stitch back the climates. We have cycles every couple of hundred million years when we have a great address in the, in the galaxy. And that address allows us to be bombarded by cosmic rays, they build up cloud cover and we cool down. We also have ice on Earth when the Earth's orbit changes. Every 100,000 years it goes from circular to elliptical. Every 43,000 years it, the axis changes a little bit. Every 20 odd thousand years the planet wobbles a bit like a top. And then we have the sun, that great ball of heat in the sky that does drive the climate. And that has cycles. They have solar maximum and solar minimum every 10,000 years. We have cycles every 1,500 years and 217 years and 22 years. And then we have lunar tidal cycles. Every 18.6 years we push warm water into the Arctic. And as a result of that, we have 60-year cycles in the ocean. And these are so well known that the Chinese had their initial calendars based on a 60-year cycle. It was based on warm water in the oceans and growing, uh, growing seasons. So all the past climates have been driven by these cycles, be they plate tectonic, be they galactic every 143 million years, or be they orbital, or be they solar. 
The laws of physics have not changed just because you're alive on planet Earth. The laws of physics are still operating and we still have those cycles. So if we look at the last ice age, within the ice age, when the ice expands, we call that glaciation. And when the, when the ice contracts, we call it an interglacial. Now our last big interglacial was between 128,000 and 116,000 years ago. And sea level was about 130 metres lower. Where I was in Akarula, we've got extremely good evidence that sea level went up and down by 600 metres. So there's no point in having conniptions about a sea level rise like that. It's, it's quite normal. But we see in that last 116,000 years, it started to cool down and started to cool down and started to cool down. And then we had a dirty big volcano in Indonesia called Toba some 70,000 years ago. And we filled the atmosphere, both hemispheres, with volcanic dust. Now this volcanic dust is just when we blasted rocks into small fragments and fine dust. And that does lapse of the planet. And we lost all the tropical vegetation. The people in the tropics were refugees and went north and went south. And that's probably when we got the first people coming onto our continent here. And they could do it because sea level was lower and they could walk here. And they could walk from the mainland to Tasmania. That's well established. So after that Tobar eruption, we really sped up cooling. The ice sheets expanded quickly. Sea level dropped about seven metres. And at 20,000 years ago, we were in the zenith of the last glaciation. Chicago had about three or four kilometres of ice on it, as did New York. England, Scotland were covered in ice. Scandinavia was covered in ice. Tasmania had ice. The Alps of Australia had ice. Inland Australia had howling anticyclonic winds bringing around sand dunes and drying out salt lakes. But Scandinavia, when we plonk five kilometres of ice on Scandinavia, it sank. That ice is gone and Scandinavia is rising. So if you go to the castle of Turku, which was on an island in the 12th century, you can now walk there. Why? Because the land's gone up. Finland was surveyed in the 17th century because the king of Finland wanted to tax people more. Sounds familiar. And <laughs> those with waterside properties found that their properties have got bigger because the land has been going up. We have had Scandinavia rise 340 metres since that ice sheet went. So just tell me about sea level again. You never hear people talking about land level changes. You hear about sea level changes. But the land goes up and down the same as the sea goes up and down. For example, the city of Ephesus in Turkey, mentioned in the Bible, was a port city. You can still see the port there. That's 15 kilometres inland and 10 metres above sea level. <laughs> That's because the land has gone up. And just near there, the city of Lydia, where gold coins were first minted, I've been down the main street of Lydia in a yacht, and it was a couple of metres beneath me. So we have very good historical records of the land going up and down. So if you're going to talk about sea level change, you have to talk about land level change as well. And we see very good evidence of that in our current interglacial times, which started about 14,400 years ago. And the ice sheets were starting to melt, sea level was rising, and then we had a breakup of the ice sheets in Canada. And we filled the oceans with icebergs, and these were floating. Underneath was actually denser but warmer water. And that took about 1,500 years before we got back to normal. That period of time is called the Younger Dryas. That was when we humans huddled into fortified villages and invented animal husbandry and invented agriculture. We very nearly became extinct. We also very nearly became extinct when Tobar erupted. We went down to about 4,000 breeding pairs of humans. So 
I'll come to extinction a little bit later, but there are events in the past that are very well documented. After the Younger Dryas, we had warming. And it was only 10 degrees Celsius over 15 years. You know, forget this 0.6 degrees over the last 150 years. That isn't warming. That is within variability. And all the measurements we make of sea level and of temperature are within natural variability. But we had a warming event. Then it, then it cooled down again. And we had the same thing, more ice break off into the oceans. And that's when a lot of people in the Anatolian highlands moved down into the Black Sea Basin. And those people in the Black Sea Basin had wonderful agriculture. They had a language, a common language, and they had, and they had metallurgy. And then we had the movement of the North Anatolian Fault. Sea level was up here in the Marmara Sea and the Black Sea was down there. And it just opened up and had water flood along the Anatolian Fault and fill up the Black Sea with people dispersing everywhere. We've got extremely good evidence from the floor of the Black Sea of this great flood. And then about 7,000 years ago, we had a warm period from about 7,000 to 4,000 years ago. That was what we call the Holocene optimum. We can see when we go around rock platforms, little nicks at the bottom of the rock platform, where sea level was about that much higher. It was about five degrees warmer. That was the peak of our interglacial. Most interglacials last for 10 or 12,000 years. We're there. We've been at the peak. And we have been cooling down for the last 4,000 years. So if people say, oh, the planet's warming, well, <clears throat> it's all about when you start the measurements. If we look at the last 38 years, there has been no change in temperature. If we look in the last 150 years, we've had three warming periods and three cooling periods with a total warmth of about 0.6 degrees Celsius. Now, I wonder why it warms. I mean, 1850, what happened then? Oh, yes, that was the end of the Little Ice Age. Do you think it's going to warm or cool after a Little Ice Age? Of course it's going to warm. So if you start taking measurements from 1850 in the Industrial Revolution, we have been warming. If you take measurements from the medieval warming, then we've been cooling. We've cooled about five degrees since then. If you take measurements from the Roman warming, we've cooled about five degrees. If you take measurements from the end of the Holocene optimum, we've cooled. So as soon as someone tells you, oh, it's warming, the reply you give is, since when? Show me the data. And as I um, asked many times in this book, if people make a statement, it only takes you 30 seconds to do a search on this and you can, you can find out the evidence. So at the Holocene maximum, Ending 4,000 years ago, we started a general cooling trend within which there are warming peaks. There are warming peaks such as the Minoan. And the Minoan Empire ended with Santorini erupting. One volcano can ruin your whole day. And <laughs> that allowed the Mycenaeans to take over. That allowed the Greeks uh, and then the Romans to be dominant in a period of warmth. And we have very good historical records. Every time it was warm, people were fed. Every time it was cold, people died. That's why we're frightened of Jack Frost. Every time it was cold, we had increased warfare. Every time it was cold, the plague took off. And we see that. We entered the Dark Ages in about 535 AD. Now, why was it called the Dark Ages? Well, it was dark culturally, but it was also dark visibility-wise. We had a dirty big volcano in Rubal, in Papua New Guinea, erupt. We had a, a big one in Indonesia erupt. We had a big one in Iceland erupt. And we went through the tail of a comet. The atmosphere was full of dust. And if you want to, to live in the good old days, try living at 535 to 550 AD. It was shocking. People were dying like flies. 
you couldn't harvest any crops because you couldn't plant them. And then the, the grain got fungus and people got St Vitus dance or ergotism. Um, it, it was a shocking time to be alive. Don't give me the good old days. They were not. And a good example of that, which I go in this book, is looking at our 20,000 generations of humans. For 20,000 generations, we've had an average longevity of 25 years. Globally now, the average longevity is 78 years. That's only happened in the last four generations. We live in the very best times ever to be a human on planet Earth. We live in the very best environments ever that we've had on planet Earth. So don't give me the good old day stuff. <laughs> Read a bit of history. Anyway, we entered the Dark Ages at 535 AD and at 900 AD we bounced out of the Dark Ages. We had warming of 5 to 8 degrees Celsius. Now there was no industry there putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This was related to the natural events that I mentioned, orbit and the sun, etc. And we had a wonderful 300 year period of warmth, the medieval warming. And we could grow two crops a year in Europe. There was so much excess wealth that it went into building the great churches and cathedrals and monasteries and universities. This was a wonderful time. It was a time of less warfare. That's what warming does. You have an increase in population and an increase in prosperity. And it took 30 years to go from the medieval warming into the Little Ice Age. 30 years, it went from 1280 the Gulf of Bothnia between Finland and Sweden was frozen in 1303. Europe got hit by the plague in 1347 because people were stressed. There was starvation. There was increased warfare. That's what happens in cold times. And in the ultra cold times, when the sun was a bit lazy, in the little ice age, we had the hoar frosts. We had uh, the Dutch masters painting these wonderful hoarfrosts. We had ice on the Thames and European rivers. And we had ice fairs. We had barbecuing of oxen on the ice. It was cold. And then it started to warm up again in 1850 to our present time. So when we look at the history of time, we haven't lived on a planet where it's been constant. And this is what our warmists want us to have is a constant past and because we are so sinful and putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere it therefore must be our fault that we can measure change so this is the background from looking at the past so what do we do with this information well we've got to stop putting all this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere so we start then to dismantle the cheap reliable systems of generating electricity. And we start to put in wind turbines and solar panels. Now there have been many calculations that have shown, and I've done it in a couple of books, that the energy used to make a wind turbine is more than it will ever produce in its working life. The carbon dioxide used, uh, released by making that is more than that wind turbine will ever save. And wind turbines only work when it's windy. You can't run an industrial society on intermittent power. You can't have a set of binoculars looking to see if the trees over there are rustling so you can um, start up whatever electrical uh, facility you want. To, but to make matters worse, in this country, if you have a factory or a mine, you have to submit a very large bond to the state government in case you go break, in case you don't clean up your mess. The wind turbine companies don't have to do that. They have thousands of tonnes of concrete, reinforced with all the steel, wires going on underground. At the end of it, they can just walk away. But to make it even worse, the turbine blades are a composite. Balsa wood from the Amazon, um, various plastics um, and various glues using a chemical called bisphenol A. Bisphenol A is banned in virtually every Western country. 
it is incredibly toxic. And at the end of the working life of those blades, they get cut up and dumped, such that these <coughs> chemicals leach out into the soils and leach out into the waterways. And the parts, the spinning magnets and the blades are made in China. So if we want wind power, we are really reliant on China. Solar power is no different. The sun effectively gives you about six hours a day of electricity and by the solar rays hitting the silicon wafers, an electron will jump and then it'll drop back again and give out electricity. Now that electron jump is based on one wavelength from the sun, not the complete spectrum. You cannot make solar power more efficient. Yes, you can use other compounds, gallium compounds and things, but you know, we've just got no gallium on planet Earth. We, we, we really cannot do better than having a silicon solar panel. Now, to make those, and there's a strong view out, and Amnesty International have published on this, that these are made by slave labour in China. The amount of energy used to make them is horrendous. And then there's all these other toxins on, on the wiring, things like arsenic and gallium and lead and indium and at the end of a solar panel's life it is dumped and those toxins leach out into the water and into the um, soils and those solar panels like the wind turbines come from China. We have made ourselves totally dependent upon China and in this book which came out late last year I've argued that Europe was totally dependent on Mr Putin's gas and what's happened, exactly that. So you cannot in any way argue that wind and solar are environmentally friendly. And especially the case with wind, where you slice and dice birds and bats, especially offshore wind. So uh, this is not an environmental solution. Now, wind and solar do not operate using the wind and the sun. They operate because of subsidies, massive subsidies which you pay. So the solution has not been wind and solar. But then the argument goes a little bit further. Oh, let's have a green car. Let us um, have electricity coming from wind and solar to charge up my electric vehicle. Problem is, if five people in your street have an electric vehicle, you don't have enough power to cook a meal that night. The amount of power that they use is enormous. The fuel range is very, very uh, small. It's getting a bit better, but it's still small. Um, the other day I drove from, when was it? Um, Tuesday, I drove from Broken Hill to Adelaide, 525 kilometres. I did that in about five and a half hours. If I was to do that in an electric car, it might have taken me two days, perhaps three days. It's just not efficient. But. <clears throat> I drive this electric car and I strut around, morally superior to you because I'm saving the planet, aren't I? And I'm virtue signalling. However, electric cars use a lot of commodities. The amount of metals that are used in electric cars is horrendous. We have not found them yet. We haven't got enough lithium, copper, nickel, cobalt, manganese. We haven't found it yet. So if everyone goes electric, the mining industry has got a real problem. It doesn't have the metals. And secondly, if you are to build these mines, do you build them in third world countries where the environmental laws are a bit slack, or do you build them in Australia? Now, I'm a, um, associated with a company called Roy Hill, which has got a big iron ore mine in Western Australia. And that needed approvals and permits to build the mine. Does anyone want to have a guess at the number of approvals and permits needed to build a mine in the Pilbara, an iron ore mining part of Western Australia, in Western Australia, an iron ore mining state, in Australia, an iron ore mining country? How many permits do you think were needed to build an iron ore mining mine in the Pilbara? 75 to 125? 75 to 125? More than that, any gain on more than that? Any gain on more than that? More than that, more than that, more than that? Can we get a higher figure? I want a higher. 300. 
300, I want a higher figure than that. Higher figure, higher figure, more than that, more than that, more than that. Come on, I need a higher figure. It is 4,950. Now, how on earth have we allowed ourselves to get into this situation? And if we need 4,950 permits and we want to produce more metal for electric cars, it will take 20 years of environmental lawfare permitting and expenditure before you can even start to get near those metals. So there's no way we can, in the Western world, produce the metals we need for electric vehicles. But they use a lot of nickel. Well, where does that nickel come from? Well, <clears throat> most of it comes from tropical soils, from the base of a tropical soil profile. And they are in third world countries. You've got to clean off all the jungle and all the soils, take out this bottom layer and process that to get nickel. In many parts of the world, like Cuba and New Caledonia, there are no environmental restoration laws. You just leave the mess. So if you want to drive an electric car with a lot of nickel in it, you're actually contributing to environmental damage in the tropics. And if you want to drive an electric car at the terminals, you've got cobalt. About 90% of cobalt is mined by black slave children in the Congo. They mine underground, they get shocking respiratory diseases, cobalt is poisonous, and they die of collapse because uh, of rocks because there are no environmental laws like we have and no mining laws like we have. So if you want to strut around with your electric car feeling morally superior, you are a supporter of destroying the environment in tropical third world countries and you are a supporter of black children being slaves in the Congo. You can't have it both ways. And then <clears throat> our subsidised wind and solar power using sea breezes and sunbeams is now going to produce hydrogen which will also be subsidised. Now, we tried that. We tried it in the 1920s. And hydrogen is one of the most explosive substances around. That's why I got into geochemistry. I used to make hydrogen and explode it and blow out windows. It was great fun. Uh, very easy to make. I'll talk to you kids later about how you make it. It's so easy. Um, and we cannot mine hydrogen. There is no hydrogen to mine except for a very small amount in Mali. But Hydrogen we have to manufacture. And to make hydrogen, we have to electrocute nine litres of water to give us one kilogram of hydrogen. It's an energy process, and we lose a lot of energy in doing it. So it's about 30% efficient. And then, once we've got the hydrogen, the most efficient way to transport it and to use it is transport it as liquid hydrogen. And to do that, we need to compress it 700 times at atmospheric pressure and cool it to minus 253. The amount of energy to do that is enormous. That is a bomb waiting to go off. Hydrogen is a very small atom. It'll move through solids. It'll move through the steel capsule that you're holding it in and will diffuse. You lose about 1% of hydrogen from a storage tank every day. This is why it wasn't used in the 20s. Too expensive and too dangerous. The only difference between the 20s and now is that we have subsidised wind and solar and that electricity is going to then be used to create subsidised hydrogen. How did we get ourselves into such a ridiculous position? Well, we're probably too wealthy. Um, I suspect that we now need to have a Dutch tulip mania or a South Sea <laughs> bubble. We need to have um, fads and fashions to fritter away money. And so I have a chapter in this book which uh, I think describes it gently. And it is called, well, I've got a chapter called How to Ruin a Country. Um, <laughs> and uh, another one called Freakonomics. And then after that is fads, fashions, fools, frauds and finances. And in effect, 
our push towards net zero, which rolls off the tongue beautifully. But then you, you've got to ask someone, well, what actually is net zero? Does that mean we're not going to have diesel? I mean, we use diesel for ploughing, for planting, for, for weeding, for harvesting, for processing and transporting food to the cities. Does that mean we have no food for the cities? Is that what you mean by net zero? What exactly do you mean by net zero? And you put the date for net zero so, so far into the future that you'll be dead by the time it, um, those policies might have to be enacted. So it is on, on the evidence that I have just given you, we have no evidence to show that human activities drive global climate change. Yes, land clearing might drive local climate change, but not global climate change. The past tells us that we've had massive ice ages and periods of warming and periods of cooling. When the atmospheric oxygen got very high, two periods in the past, we had global bushfires. We know it from all the charcoal and ash in sediments. We know it from the increased erosion we see from past sequences. We know in the past that um, tribal people in Africa, the US, Canada and Australia had uh, cool fires burning back uh, the, the wood and the timber such that they could have hunting in grasslands. We don't do that any longer. And we know uh, there's something like 30 reports that are telling us that we should be cleaning up our forests to um, stop these catastrophic bushfires. So by not looking at the past, we end up with a very, very confused picture of the present. And those pizzas coming out are telling me to stop. Um, <coughs> the last item I want to deal with is the Great Barrier Reef. And my answer is, which one? We've had barrier reefs in Australia for a long, long time. Out in Western Australia, we've got a barrier reef. It goes for miles. This was a barrier reef hundreds of millions of years ago. There's a great barrier reef inland from our great barrier reef. I saw it a couple of weeks ago at Chiligo in far north Queensland. We have reefs going right back in time. The first reef we ever had was 3,500 million years ago. These reefs came and they went. They come when the water's warm, they disappear when they, the water's cold or they get exposed to the air or they get inundated with volcanic ash and sediment. We've had a long history of reefs. Our first coral reefs were those at Arkarula about 650 million years ago. But coral really got itself established in reefs about 520 million years ago. And reefs have come and reefs have gone. The Great Barrier Reef has come and gone five times in the last 30,000 years. And having a reef attacked by the crown of thorns is quite normal. There's biological warfare going on all the time. In your stomach, you've got biological warfare between bacteria. 90% of your cells are bacteria. 15% of your weight is bacteria. You are a creeping colony of critters. And <laughs> if the balance is wrong, you die. So we see this in the fossil record of, of coral reefs that are fighting a predator and then win, and then the predator fights them somewhere else. This is normal. So we are being fed a lot of hysteria about the Great Barrier Reef. And again, you only have to do a search on a smartphone, it takes you 30 seconds, and you can find out that the Great Barrier Reef has a long history of coming and going. And that's tied into the scary thing about extinction. Oh, frightening. Now, we've had five major mass extinctions on life, of life on Earth. And each one of these five was due to either volcanic events, extraterrestrial events, but not due to climate change. We've had over, over 20 minor mass extinctions, and again, not one of them can we see is due to a global climate change. And since 
the explosion of predation of life some 520 million years ago, we've had a species turnover. So the number of species on Earth has been increasing enormously and they turn over. So you might become extinct and where you live is filled by another animal. This is quite normal. And this is called species turnover. We have species turnover all the time. And we are having new species appear all the time and old species go out backwards. Now a major mass extinction is when you lose about 70% of species on Earth. A minor mass extinction is when you lose about 25 or 30%. We're, no, we're not at that level. We're having a species turnover. So the whole argument that's put up by Extinction Rebellion and these people is misleading and deceptive. So I argue in this book that everything the Greens promote end up in killing economies, killing the environment, killing wildlife, and my argument I put up in this book is that the Greens are an anti-human group who want to control you, but don't want to be elected, uh, a group who want to uh, basically empty your wallet and carry on with their nirvana. But if you look at the past, the best times are when it was warm. And I don't fear global warming. What I fear is another event of cooling. Because places like Northern Europe, Russia, Ukraine, Canada, they won't be able to produce wheat. Um, we'll find in inland Australia, we'll go back to howling winds and sand dunes. We'll find that um, here it will be much, much colder. I don't fear warming. And if I have to fear something, which I don't, um, it would be cooling. History is on my side. And so I appeal to you that if you are concerned about global warming and the environment, read history. Read about the cold times in the past. Read a little bit of basic geology and you will see that we are living in the best times ever to have lived on planet Earth. I think my beer has warmed up enough <laughs> and uh, I'm open to questions. <laughs> questions, I'm not that scary. What makes you right and the IPCC right? Uh, evidence. Um, the IPCC um, is basically a group that compiles all the scientific work that's been done on um, changes and warming. However, they have uh, omitted tens of thousands of scientific papers that give the opposite view. It's a bit like me getting cancelled tonight from two pubs. This is what's happening. Science is now absolutely and totally politicised. Um, and this is why that the IPCC have to be um, questioned. The IPCC models are telling us that we're going to fry and die in the future. We've had 30 years of these models and we can show that that's not true. It's wrong. Um, the numbers don't lie. So these IPCC predictions are based on models. They're not based on measurements. And the IPCC reports, the latest one of 3,000 pages, is divided into two sections. The first is a summary for policy makers and politicians, and the second is the science. And the science is quite reserved. The science is not hysterical, but it's the summary for policy makers, which few journalists read and no politicians read, which is the hysterical part of it. And you have to remember the IPCC is not a scientific organisation, it's a political organisation. And, um, of course, they're going to beat their own drum. So, in science, I don't like to use right or wrong. I like to use evidence. And if you omit evidence uh, that is contrary to your ideas, then you're not dealing with science. And that's why um, I hope I can live long enough uh, to be able to see uh, a change in 
our South Sea bubble or um, Dutch tulip mania mentality we're currently enjoying. Well, your first part of the question is, you ask what is the ideal climate? And you ask uh, an Eskimo, someone from the jungles of Borneo, and someone in the Kalahari Desert. You will get three different answers. Now, we humans can live on the ice sheets and at the equator. We can live in a huge range of temperatures. You cannot get an average temperature for planet Earth because of the spacing of the measuring stations, which are concentrated in mainly the US, and there are many parts of the world where temperature is not measured, but it's based on five degree by five degree squares, and if it's not measured, there's an estimate made. So you cannot get an average temperature. The second thing is that we find in many uh, measuring organisations, including our own Bureau of Meteorology, with the ancient measurements, they will depress them, and the modern measurements therefore make it look as if we're having warming. So those measurements, I think, um, have been altered, and I don't have a problem with people altering measurements unless, um, the, until I can see the reason why. And uh, Jennifer Marahassi has been chasing the BOM on, for a long while on this, and they haven't given suitable answers as to why they've changed the measurements. Now, what is the ideal carbon dioxide content? Well, I will ask someone who is a submariner and they will say 8,000 parts per million in the atmosphere. In this room now, because of the number of people, the carbon dioxide content would be over 1,000 parts per million. In the air, it's just over 410 parts per million. It's not killing you. There is no ideal but in the past, we have measurements done by wet chemical techniques that show massive variability. And these were done in industrial areas of Europe. Um, and this uh, Pentenkoffer method um, was abandoned in 1959 and an infrared technique was used, but there was never an overlap of measurements. And the infrared technique gives us a very smooth line, whereas the Pentenkoffer method gives us carbon dioxide going up and down. So I'm not sure we've even got the historical carbon dioxide record right. So um, that's a good question to ask because there is no answer that a climate catastrophist can give you. They say the average temperature of the planet is 15 degrees Celsius, but how do you measure it? What do you think would happen if the temperature rose 3 or 4 or 5 degrees? What would be the net effect of that? Well, we've had that in the past when we humans have been alive. We had it in Roman and Greek times, we had it in Minoan times, we had it in the medieval times, and we have the atmosphere operating like an air conditioner. When we evaporate uh, water, uh, that requires energy. And when we precipitate water, we give out energy. So we're basically transferring energy in our atmosphere by evaporation. That's why the oceans drive uh, the climate. It's, it's not the inverse. It's not the atmosphere driving the oceans. It's the absolute inverse. And a good example of that would be if you're cool, run a hot bath, and the whole bathroom heats up because that's water giving out heat. Do the inverse. Run a cold bath and have a radiator going in the bathroom. The water doesn't heat up. So water has a very high heat capacity. It is water that drives the way the atmosphere operates. And the energy for that comes from the sun. And we shift that energy around the earth with ocean currents, and we shift it with warm air going from the equator uh, to the poles. It's not just simply putting out a very small amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, I've been r rambling and raving. Um, that's the answer, but I've forgotten what your question was. <laughs> Look, I have something to win. Yes, have something no, 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 no. I'm, I'm on a roll. I'm on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Did you say that your fear as it's warming up is giving off carbon dioxide? Yes. Yeah. So if you were a, a brewery, for example, Shell, 
Global no, you're not contributing to global warming. You're adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. No, but if you're a believer that carbon dioxide is creating global warming, yes. then, then you, you would have to believe that your industry that you're involved in is actually... You'd have to give up wine, you'd have to give up beer, you'd have to give up bread, <laughs> uh, you'd have to give up having these foods delivered to you by a hydrocarbon-driven vehicle. There's no logic in the whole lot. <laughs> Three words, follow the money. This has got nothing to do with what you're talking about, which is efficient energy production and um, being frugal economically. It is all about subsidies. And the quickest way to beat the bushes and change all of this is to just stop subsidies. We can say, oh, well, we've had wind and solar for decades now, they're well established. They now no longer need subsidies, especially in this country where we've got nine on a trillion dollars of debt, which you will pay. I'll, I'll be dead, but you'll pay it. And um, that's the most simple way. And you can imagine the lobby groups and the squealing and the carrying on if you, if you cut subsidies. Now, subsidies don't come from nowhere. When people talk about government money, it isn't government money, it's your money. And um, to pay for this, it's your taxes and your increased electricity costs that are being used to fund it. And to make matters worse, if you want to run solar and wind facilities, most of the time you destroy good farming land with the solar and, and the aesthetics and farming land with the wind, but that's a long way away. And that's got to come in transmission lines. Those transmission lines at the end of the line can't carry the load you actually have to build a new transmission system. The very best place to put wind and solar generators is in the beachside suburbs of Melbourne and Sydney mm -hmm. and, and put these wind turbines in their parks. Um, because in Warringah is a very good seat to think about because these are the uh, big consumers of power. You don't have to rebuild the grid and you don't have the voltage drop. So you're creating the electricity right next to the user. So. Um, that, that's the obvious solution to it. And, uh, don't, ever think, don't ever think of the word hypocrisy. That's, that's <laughs> not part of the lexicon. And, uh, just to, um, just the, my second question is, so when I was at school, we got shown the hour clock. And um, my teacher then took, took it as gospel. And, um, and according to that hour clock, we should probably be underwater now. Um, but there doesn't seem to be any consequence. Well, well, let me add to that. Al Gore, like Tim Flannery and many others, are telling us sea level is going to rise 20 feet, yet have bought waterfront properties. Uh, don't let the word hypocrisy enter your mind. Um, the second thing is that uh, a, a school governor in the UK complained about that Al Gore film being shown to people at his school, went to court, and a court in the UK showed that there were 12 fundamental scientific errors in that film and it should be withdrawn from the schools. The third thing is that you have a very compliant media and these, the, the media, um, except possibly for Sky in this country, but the media is very happy uh, to go along with scare campaigns and uh, the media uh, folk are somewhat scientifically ignorant you can ask them a very simple question when they talk about carbon pollution. You can say, well, carbon's black. How can you see me if we've got pollution and it, it is black? Um, these people are um, scientifically illiterate. They are at the same literacy level as someone who cannot read and write. Yet they are driving the agenda uh, in the media. 
So I go back to a quote of Albert Einstein. Um, if you want a long life, eat sparingly and don't read newspapers. So <laughs> my suggestion is do not get into social media. Uh, and if you are to read, in today's world, we have so many opportunities for so many different views that you need not be shackled by the mainstream media. Question? Oh, I envy you. Mine's still here. <laughs> you indicated that volcanoes were a, a, a bit of a culprit, perhaps, in, in history of, of a negative nature. Um, do we know, are we capable of forecasting what might happen in that, in that space over the next few hundred years, seeing as their place is a major role? Um, I'll give you two examples and I'll answer your question. The answer to your question is no, we can't do it yet. But we have had very heavy rains in eastern Australia. Now, we know from the eruption of the volcano Tambora in 1815 that the following year was the year without a summer. Uh, this is when there was some fairly bleak poetry and literature written. This was a pretty depressing time. And for the next three years, there was increased rainfall. Why? Because Tambora exploded and put tiny little bits of broken up glassy material high into the atmosphere. Go to the 19th of January this year. We had an eruption at Tonga. It, instead of pushing material up to 25 kilometres in the atmosphere, it went to 58 kilometres. And every time it, it does a lap, it starts to fall. And once it gets into the atmosphere where you can have condensation around that minuscule particle, you will get precipitation. And so you see these rain events. Hey, I haven't started that yet. Oh. You are wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> So every time we get that ash doing a lap, we have a rain event. We've had three laps. We've had three rain events. And this we know from history. So these volcanoes can have a profound effect. Now, if it's combined with something else, which is what's happening now, the La Nina, then um, the combination of having warm, moist air and particles for nucleation gives you heavy rain. But, of course, if you live in Lismore, you've got to blame the Prime Minister uh, for heavy rain and floods. Uh, if you've got a different Prime Minister in former times, well, they don't get blamed. Now, we have about 1,800 volcanoes on Earth that we can see. Some of them are in populated areas, and we have a lot of instruments there, measuring the tilt of the land, measuring the gases coming out, measuring the temperature of the gases, and we're getting pretty good at predicting when an eruption will take place. I was at Merapi when it erupted in Indonesia about 15 years ago. And it was predicted to the day when it was going to erupt. I mean, that's fabulous because it saves lives. We, we can't predict earthquakes nearly as well. We might be able to in the future. But um, these are these 1,800 volcanoes. And these are volcanoes where the type of lava there doesn't have much carbon dioxide dissolved in it. However, on the ocean floor, we have some three and a half million identified volcanoes. On the ocean floor, this type of lava dissolves up to 13 and a half percent by weight carbon dioxide. On the ocean floor, we have pools of liquid carbon dioxide. On the ocean floor, we have more than 60,000 kilometres of mid-ocean ridges where we're constantly leaking out carbon dioxide. The one thing you never hear from our climate people is what's happening down there. They tell us what's happening in the air, but they don't tell us what's happening beneath our feet. And in the oceans, which occupy 71% of the surface of the earth, we are putting a huge amount of carbon dioxide into those oceans. We don't know. I've tried to do the calculation and tried to get colleagues to help, 
But we do know that of the 97% of emissions, those are the natural emissions, most of that comes out of the oceans. Whether it's carbon dioxide that's come from the air and been dissolved in the ocean, or whether it's volcanic carbon dioxide, we don't know. But once we've got a molecule of carbon dioxide in the air, most of the scientific evidence says that it's going to stay in the air for five to seven years, whereas the IPCC are telling us it's going to stay there for 200 years. We've very little evidence to support that. Now, if you've got carbon dioxide in the air for a short time and goes into the oceans, then it dissolves. And it combines with calcium, which the big rivers bring into the ocean, to precipitate limestone. So we are constantly sequestering carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere by natural process. Again, I'm rambling. I've got no idea where we're going. Volcanoes, that's it. <laughs> so um, when we're dealing with climate, it's all very nice to say volcanoes contribute very little. These are the volcanoes that we see. But the ones that we don't see are the ones where um, I suspect they have a, a significant effect on carbon dioxide in the oceans and, of course, later in the atmosphere. We have volcanoes that have been catastrophic. We know from when Benjamin Franklin was in Paris in 1783, he recorded a white smoky sky and how people were coughing and how the air smelt of sulphur gases. This was from the eruption of Lucky putting out sulphur gases in the atmosphere, which reflect light and heat, uh, producing acid rain and killing people with weak lungs. Mm. So we've known for a long while that volcanoes can kill. We, uh, they're, they're wonderful catastrophic stories about volcanoes, but the big volcanoes are beneath the ocean, uh, are on the ocean floor, beneath the sea level, and we ignore them. Yeah. Another question. Weather <coughs> warfare. Uh, sorry, I missed the last bit. Are you familiar with any of uh, I've read a little bit about it, but it's not an area I could comment on sensibly. But, I mean, we're all aware that weather plays a very important role in, in warfare, you know. Yeah, I'd want to see evidence on that. Um, uh, and again, I say it's something about which I know very little. More questions while you enjoy a pizza and I'm here <laughs> quivering with starvation and in Germany they call this flusigus brought. So I'll have some liquid bread. Ian, uh, nuclear power, do you see that as a threat to the If you are a true greenie and don't want to put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, you only have one choice for power, and that's nuclear. Now, in this country, we export 6,000 tonnes of uranium in yellow cake for other countries to use. We're the only G20 country that doesn't have nuclear power. If you've ever had to have radiation therapy or radiotherapy uh, or had cancer, you need that a reactor at Lucas Heights, a 20 megawatt Opal reactor. You need it uh, because the isotopes that are created are very short lived. It was deliberately put close to Sydney Airport in the bush, although it's now surrounded by houses, but I remember going on a school excursion there, it was in the middle of nowhere. It was deliberately close to the airport so you could get these isotopes to the airport and fly them to the Pacific Islands or Broome or Darwin for people that needed these. If you've ever had cancer, you have to be a strong supporter of the nuclear industry. So again, this is absolute and total hypocrisy in this country. We have already the foundations of a 560 megawatt power station. They were poured in Jarvis Bay in the late 60s. That was never built. So um, it is the only solution if you are concerned about the environment. Now, if you're not concerned about the environment and concerned about the pocket, it again is the only solution. Wind and solar are not going to give you power 24-7. It's only 
coal-fired power stations, all gas, um, hydro is normally used for peak load, um, and nuclear. They're the only things. So um, you can't have it both ways. And the end result of, of increasing the number of these slice and dice machines and uh, solar panels and having no nuclear is that we will get poorer. No two ways about it. Our energy costs have gone through the roof and they will continue to go through the roof. Communicating that to government and a, and a liberal government, a conservative government, um, doesn't seem to have really got us anywhere. I mean, there's individuals uh, who have been attentive to what you're saying and others are saying. What, what's what's the answer? I mean, where, where do we go in terms of influencing public policy uh, and future governments? Is, is there a hope that we might get some progress in understanding within government? Or well, a good question. I'm envious because you've got an empty plate. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Go and bring it in. <laughs> no, 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 please don't. I'm, I'm just. No, no. I'm here to entertain, not to inform. Um, Sorry, I needed a drink for myself. So okay. I need an excuse. Okay, we've got a deep green party. Um, we've got a dark green party, and we've got a light green party. Now there are quite a few in the Liberal National Party uh, who share my view. Um, I the other day I had a a lady leading a party send me a video clip of this book here and she'd marked every, and she was just flicking through it like that and she'd marked every single page. But Pauline Hanson's on side. There's a hell of a lot of people in the Nats and the Libs who are on side, but they don't dare say anything. I mean, look at that ghastly treasurer in New South Wales. He's in the wrong party. He should be in the Greens. He shouldn't be in the Liberals. So what has happened is that we've had a lot of scientific ignorance, and you've got to remember politicians are only interested in getting re-elected, they have less of an interest in building a nation, and very few of them have a scientific training. There, is a, there was a chap, Craig Kelly, in the seat of Hughes, Liberal Party, left, is now Palmer. Um, Matt Canavan, he can, he can quote these books yeah. non-stop. So there, there are people there. Alex Antic, yes, my mate Alex in uh, South Australia. Yeah. Uh, quite a lot, actually, but they keep their head down because they don't want to get cancelled. I think the solution to this is to keep um, plugging away, and I do. Uh, I talk in many private functions. The Labor Party had me once talk. I've never been invited back. Um, <laughs> I had Corey Bernardi, when he was in the Liberals, have me talk in Canberra. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull didn't come along, but uh, pretty well had all the others. And Nicole Flint's had me come along and talk to them. Uh, Craig Kelly's had me come along and talk. So um, this is long-term warfare that I'm engaged in. I just hope I live long enough to be able to see the results. But I think we will only get a significant policy change if we have a depression in this country or a war. Now that, unfortunately, uh, is not good news. But I suspect that's the only reason we're going to get it. We are so comfortable. How many of you people got shot at when you were coming here? How many got held up by a highwayman? How many of you had a big bacterial blast that took out your whole family? You know, that's what happened a few hundred years ago. We are just so well off. And, and, and yet we, we are vacuous. Yeah, we, we are destroying the civilization that made us. Um, we, are, we are destroying the very essence of the West, which has taken 2,000 years or more than that um, uh, to get us where we are. So I think we've got to have a massive catastrophe before people say, hmm, I, I wonder what went wrong. Yeah. Um, and we've seen it before, it's happened before, mm -hmm. and I just hope I live long enough to see it. I, I don't want to see people suffer, but you know, I, I spent a lot of my life working in the third world. Currently I'm working in Ecuador, uh, you know, that's a really poor country, uh, a very poor country. They don't care about climate change. They care about having their kids educated and having a feed. I spent a lot of my life working in Namibia. Same thing. They don't care. A lot of my life I spent working in Turkey. 
Again, they want their kids to have a better life than them. They don't care about climate. It's only when we um, have stripped away religion and created a new religion with no music, no history, no logic, no scholarship, and we sit around clinging on to remnants of Christianity like guilt. Um, and and uh, we hang on to these, um, and thank you very much. Uh, we hang on to these, and, and, and yet we can buy our indulgences with, with our wind turbines and, and, and with our solar panels. So the, these green groups have actually got all the essence of, of a fundamentalist religion, but none of, none of the strengths, like a history, um, like music. And I'm a great lover of classical music. That came out of the church. And where did counterpoint come from? It didn't come from a green. It came out of the church. Where did opera come from? And as I mentioned, I'm going to Halka in uh, Warsaw on the 30th of June. Where did that come from? It came from the church. So what we are doing is stripping out everything that's culturally important to us and replacing it with nothing. And that, to me, is a worry. This is why I think we have to have a period of suffering before we can, uh, we can say, where did we go wrong?